So we're going to talk about now a class of oscillators known as sinusoidal oscillators. Uh, and they're different from the relaxation oscillators that we have previously seen, um, in that the sinusoidal oscillators typically use what we know as a unity gain loop, closed loop method. And the idea behind them is that any closed loop system, and that's any system containing either positive or negative feedback, uh, which has sufficient gain and phase shift, has the potential for oscillation, whether that oscillation is uh, an unintended effect, uh, as in the case of amplifiers, or a desirable effect, as in the case of oscillators. And so the idea behind uh, the design of sinusoidal oscillators is how do we find the conditions uh, within that closed loop to the conditions for sustained oscillation. And so in order to illustrate that, I have represented a generic uh, feedback system here. Uh, there is uh, first an amplifier of gain A, uh, forward gain A, and then the output of that amplifier, which is going to be equal to the gain A times the input applied to the amplifier V in, is going to be sampled and run through a feedback network with a feedback factor equal to beta. And that's going to be fed back to the input. And so what's coming out of there as the new input signal is um, A times beta, which is what we understand as the loop gain, times the previous value of the input signal. And so notice that there are, uh, there are three possibilities. If we consider from the point of view of our loop gain, which we will represent as G sub L, and as we mentioned, is equal to A times beta, uh, there is the possibility where A times beta is less than 1. And if A times beta, the loop gain is less than 1, uh, what's going to happen is after I go through the uh, closed loop, every time I'm multiplying my input times a number that is less than 1, and so um, every time my input gets smaller and smaller, and so my oscillation will die out over time. In the opposite case where I have A times beta being greater than 1, Again, as I go through my feedback loop uh, multiple times, every time I go through it, I'm multiplying my input times a number that is greater than 1, uh, and so my input goes increasing uh, at every turn. And so I will have a growing oscillation or an increasing oscillation, uh, which will eventually uh, be limited by the saturation voltage of my amplifier or what have you. And uh, the, the last case, the third case is where I have my loop gain being equal to exactly 1. And what's going to happen in that case is that uh, every time I go through the cycle, through the whole loop, uh, my input signal is being multiplied times a factor of 1, and so the input signal that I get to feed on the next uh, round is exactly the same. And so that will be um, the condition that will allow me to have a sustained oscillation. Now, that condition for sustained oscillation is typically referred to as the Barkhausen criterion for oscillation, in honor of uh, the person who came up with it. Um, and the Barkhausen criterion basically tells us that in order to sustain a steady oscillation, um, it requires to have the loop gain GL or A times beta be equal to unity. And that's the name uh, unity gain closed loop system. Now, in general, my uh, loop gain is going to be a function of frequency. So I can write GL uh, as a function of J omega. And uh, uh, any function of J omega uh, is I'm, I'm going to be able to represent via its magnitude response and its phase response. So GL will represent the overall frequency response. I can express it as a magnitude of GL of omega and a phase theta of omega. And so if I wanted to rewrite my Barkhausen criterion based on this um, polar representation of my uh, my frequency response, my trust in response for the system, I could just simply say that GL of J omega must be equal to the, the magnitude of the, of, the, um, of the transfer function, of the transfer function must be equal to 1, and the phase shift must be equal to 0 degrees, or equivalently uh, 360 degrees, or any 
integer multiple of 360 degrees. So more generally, we could express the phase as n times 360 degrees, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. It's just an integer number. So as long as uh, my magnitude is equal to 1 and my overall phase shift is equal to 0 degrees or equivalent, an integer multiple of 360, uh, I will have the condition for sustained oscillation. Now, I've written GL in polar form, but I could also write my GL as a, uh, as a function of frequency in rectangular form. And in rectangular form, there's going to be a real part, uh, so there's going to be a real part of GL of J omega plus J times the imaginary part of GL of J omega. If I wanted to rewrite my Parkhausen criterion uh, in rectangular form, it will imply that uh, the real part J of J omega must be equal to 1. And my imaginary part must be equal to 0. Sorry, not 0 degrees, but 0. And that's just based on the fact that if I were to represent it in the complex plane, I will need to have a magnitude of 1 and a, an angle of 0 degrees. And so that just means um, a number with a real part of 0, of, uh, excuse me, of 1, and an imaginary part of 0. That will give me the, the vector with a magnitude of 1 and the angle of 0 degrees. Just labeling my imaginary plane there. Um, so in a more complex system, this is just a, a simple system uh, where we say, oh, the gain is equal to 1, the phase shift is equal to 0. Uh, but in some cases, in most cases, I'm going to have a complex system where I will have different stages, uh, potentially different stages, both in my forward uh, loop and in my uh, feedback network. And so I could come up with um, a more generic rule, um, perhaps call it conditions for steady oscillation in multi-stage systems. And I'm going to call them multi-stage feedback systems because we don't need to have the feedback for oscillation. Um, and now we know that the overall magnitude of a system, of a multi-stage system, is going to be equal to the product of the magnitudes. And so we're going to say that um, product of magnitudes around the loop must be equal to 1. And then again, when we have a multi-stage system and each one, each stage may have a different phase shift for the signal, uh, the way we calculate the overall phase shift is by adding uh, the phase shift of the different stages. And so um, sum of phase shifts around the loop must be equal to uh, 0 degrees or equivalent, which is an integer multiple of 360, where n is equal to n, 0, 1, 2, etc. Uh, and so this is, in essence, the, the more generic uh, expression for the Backhausen criterion. And just to illustrate uh, the Backhausen criterion, we're going to um, look at an example. And this is just a generic um, example from a high level of abstraction. So I have drawn a feedback loop system comprised of four stages, so a four-stage system. Uh, and let's imagine that we have uh, the first stage um, with a gain of 10 and a phase shift of 180 degrees. Uh, that's perhaps an inverting amplifier. And uh, then I'm going through a second stage, A2, which so far is an unknown, is the one that I need to design. Uh, let's imagine my third stage is an all-pass phase lag system uh, with a gain of 1 and a phase shift of negative 135 degrees. And then the last stage uh, has a gain of 0 0.02 and a phase shift of 0 degrees. Uh, which could be a resistive network, for example. And I want to figure out uh, what, how do I need to set up my uh, A2 stage in order to have this be a sinusoidal oscillator, in order to meet the Barkhausen criterion for oscillation. 
And again, the Barhausen criterion is going to require that the overall gain around the loop is equal to 1, and the overall phase shift is 0 for an integer multiple of 360 degrees. So I could write my, uh, my expression here, my overall loop gain, is going to be equal to the product of the different gains. And so it's going to be equal to 10, 180 degrees times A2, which I don't know um, yet what it is, but I'm going to refer to it as the magnitude of A2 and the phase shift theta 2 times 1 with an angle of negative 135 degrees times uh, 0 0.02 with an angle of 0 degrees. And so basically I want uh, my GL. I could simplify this and just say um, it end end ends up being a function where the magnitude response is equal to the product of those magnitudes, 10 times A2 magnitude times 1 times 0 0.02 or basically 0.2 times A2. Uh, with a phase angle of 180 degrees, minus 135 degrees, uh, plus 0 degrees. So basically theta 2, plus 45 degrees. And basically from the Barkhausen criterion, what I need is for the magnitude of GL, which is equal to 0.2 times the magnitude of A2, I want that to be equal to 1. And the 4 from there, I get that the magnitude of my A2 system is equal to 5. And uh, my theta 2 plus 45 degrees must be equal to uh, an integer multiple of 360 degrees. And so I have that theta 2 will be equal to negative 45 degrees if I make n equals to 0. So basically my missing stage up there um, is going to be equal to my A2. It's basically going to have the following uh, transfer function, a uh, magnitude of 5 and an angle of phase shift of negative 45 degrees. And again, this is just a sort of a toy example, uh, but it, it gives us an idea of how to apply the Barhausen criterion in practice, but also it gives us an idea of the power of uh, looking at circuits and at systems from a higher level of abstraction. Now, uh, if, if we have represented all these different systems uh, with their circuits, it might have looked very complicated to make sure that the gain is equal to 1, but if we are able to um, uh, compartmentalize and, and look at each stage based on the, each stage transfer function, it becomes easier to figure out the conditions for oscillation. And so this is the kind of methodology that we're going to try to follow uh, when we look at uh, oscillator circuits. Thank you.